And now I would like to introduce our guests, Lori Toby Ellison and Debbie Notkin, photographer and author of the book Women and Large. We have copies of this book. For, they have they brought copies with them that you may purchase. We will explore the issues of body image, size oppression, size acceptance, period. What beliefs, conditioning, and myths do we have for ourselves and others about whom is attractive, healthy, and socially acceptable. Please give a strong welcome to Debbie and Lori. Okay, well, I'm Lori, and I'm Lori Toby Edison. And I'm Debbie, and I want to just thank Occupy Sonoma County for having us and wish you all the luck in the world with your anti GMO <coughs> venture, which relates to bodies in just a very different way. And then Lori's going to start. Yeah, I think Lori is going to start by, in addition to the slides, I'm going to pass around some copies of books just so that people, and that shares, just be, so that people, and I think we'll just start with different rows, so let me give you this and this, and I will pass these over here. It, it gives people at the same time kind of a greater sense of the extensiveness of the work. And I should say that the Familiar Men, which is a book of male nudes, which we'll also be talking about a bit later, um, are both of these books are books of nudes. So if there is anything about that that is going to make she's going to make anyone in the audience uncomfortable, just pass the book on to your neighbor. Okay, so Debbie and I have been working together on work around body image basically since 1984. Our first project, and we'll talk very shortly about how that came together, was Women on Large Images of Fat Nudes. And this photograph and the first photograph that you saw up there are from that project. What we wanted was a, a book of beautiful and powerful fat women as, among other things, an antidote to the way the society feels about the human body and with the complete insane obsession with thinness that has been going, well, we're now in, we're post-millennia, so I was going to say in the 20th and has only accelerated in the 21st century. And our second project was Familiar Men, uh, which is a book of nudes. This, this is a book of male nudes of men, was very respectful as both of them are nude portraits of men basically from 19 to 92. And it's something we almost never see, which is what men really look like. And then the Japanese really liked the work. And as a result, images from women on large were in a major museum show in Tokyo. Actually, at this point, quite a long time ago. And that led to Women of Japan, which was a co in collaboration with Japanese feminists. And those were clothed portraits of Japanese women from very different backgrounds and different parts of the culture. And it's a very different cu culture and we learned a great deal from that. Yeah. In each of these projects, we were looking for all kinds of diversity, and you'll see that as we go through. And in all of these, we did community outreach so that people would be doing what you were doing now, which is seeing the slides, hearing us talk about the projects, and then asking the audience, many of whom obviously were the people that we were interested in photographing, what they wanted to see, how they wanted to see themselves. Right. And what, what are you missing? What do you wish you knew? What did you have access to? What have we left out that's important? Right. And that was that had profound influence on all three of the projects. So uh, this is a teach-in. We're going to want a lot of audience input. We know you can teach us. But we usually find that it helps to start with our story of how we got started. Um, it was 19, or, you know, 1983, 1982. Lori and I were just getting to be friends. Uh, we we're both members of the same sort of small subculture, which is the science fiction and, and fantasy fandom subculture. And there was a very powerful man in that culture who was himself, by the way, pretty fat, who kind of went on a crusade 
against against fat women, and he said uh, there should be a weight limit for the purchase of leotards. He said there was nothing scarier than going to a nudist colony and meeting a 350-pound woman with an appendectomy scar. Well, I can think of scarier things. Um, but in any event, I, I, I was younger. I was not aware of this work particularly, and I got very upset. And I cried on Laurie's shoulder one day, and Laurie said, let's do something about it. <laughs> no, actually, I said, what? No, more accurately, I said, what can we do about it? Right. And um, from that has come all of this work, really, from that one story. Um, Lori started working in metal and jewelry, which is her original art form. She started sculpting fat women. It wasn't, it, they were beautiful. I still have one, but they didn't have the political power that we were looking for at all. Um, let, let's actually change the slide. Um, and so she started, Lori became a photographer to do this work and is now an internationally acclaimed photographer uh, because she has an incredible eye. And uh, so what, what did we find out? We found out that body oppression is not just size and fat, although that's a huge factor. It's skin color, it's complexion, it's age, it's ability. It's just about anything that people can judge you by when they just see you, right? When they don't know anything about you except how you look, whatever judgments they can form, that's, um, that's body oppression. Yeah. And I am going to go back a little bit in terms of how this happened, because the first thing that happened was we started doing panels on fat and feminism. And I was the token skinny on the panel because I could say that the medical information are lies, that it's mostly paid for by the diet industry, et cetera, et cetera. And people were not going to tell me that I was rationalizing because of how I looked. And I need to check, because I just saw you do this. Can you yeah. hear me back there? I'm having trouble hearing. Okay. I'm having trouble hearing. Okay. Is this better? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Then let me project. There's two seats up here, <laughs> right in front. But let's. Let, we can also try and. We'd love to have you move up if you want to. But well, we can, can also, also try project. And project. <coughs> okay. And do me a favor. If you can't hear me, do okay. this, please. Because okay. I'm. What's liable to happen is I will talk like this for a while, and then someone's going to ask a question. And I'm going to get involved in what I'm saying, and my voice is going to drop. So please keep me posted, so to speak. Yeah, anyway, and I looked at the women, and I realized it was a kind of beauty that had not been done in art in the 20th, or now, of course, we're in the 21st century. And I decided that I wanted to do it for two reasons. As an artist, <coughs> it was a completely fresh place to do work. And politically, as we all know, pictures are absolutely true. So uh, politically, it was a way to really change lives. And that's really where it started. I took three months of classes. I've been a working artist for 20 years before that. So the composition and everything was very clear. And basically, Debbie and I made a book with very, very strong contributions, both for the women in the pictures and with the texts. And um, we, we self-published because feminist presses kept wanting to do it, but not quite there. And we sold 10,000 copies. Ooh, so clearly there was a there was and is a place for this work in the world. And actually, um, so one thing people ask us a lot is, you know, if you, we've been doing this work since 1984, what's changed? <laughs> um, and it was interesting being on Elaine's show this morning because that reminded us some of what hasn't changed. But what has changed is there is a lot more awareness of body oppression, there's a lot more awareness. There are countless, countless websites and blogs, some of them absolutely brilliant, um, about loving your body, about appreciating yourself at any size. There's a medical movement called Health at Any Size that has some, um, some gravitas. People know it, doctors follow it. And at the same time, this work, which started out very radical, the first book was called Shadow on a Tightrope. It came out of the California lesbian community. It's a brilliant, brilliant book. It's just been reissued. 
Uh, the work was very radical, it was very diverse, it had people from all kinds of races and ages and classes. And it has been in the, as it has gotten bigger and more popular, surprise, we live in capitalism. The corporations have tried to pick it up and have so smoothed it out and made it prettier and made it simpler and made it whiter. Uh, in particular, I'm thinking of the Dove campaign for real beauty, which encourages you to love your body so you can buy their skin whitening creams. <laughs> um, let's think about that just for a moment, okay? Um, yeah, if it was really a campaign for real beauty, why would you be buying those products? And it's everywhere. I mean, it's in the media, it's in the magazines, it's on the web. There is a constant barrage of love your body, but there's something wrong with it, and we can help you fix it. Mm -hmm. And when we started this work, I think one of the biggest changes, we started this work, it was really almost exclusively about women. What we used to say was, you know, for men to be fat, you know, women are fat here, men don't get fat till they're here. I'm not doing size now, I am doing, right. you know, kind of what's acceptable. And the range of what was acceptable for men was like this, and the range of what was acceptable for women was like this. And that changed. And this men are under very much the same pressures now. The difference is the acceptable size range for women is now like this, and the acceptable size range for men is now like this. Right. But that, that is, that's one of the big changes. The other one is just how young is directed at kids, particularly young girls. You know, they were not, there was not media and commercial and commodification pressure on like six-year-olds when we started this work. And now, they're, they're, now it's just out there constantly. So this is maybe a good time first to ask for questions or responses from the audience before we change internal topics. Yes. Well, maybe that aspect has changed for girls, but now there's the sexualization of really young girls that didn't happen when I was a kid. That's yes. part of what I was saying. Because oh. with the sexualization... It's related to what you were saying. It's related to what you were saying, because with the sexualization of little girls comes all the pressure to be thin and beautiful, attractive and sexy. Right. The sexual... I think that's a really, really important point. What I would say is that the... The sexualization of girls is forces them to fit into what we define as sexy. Mm -hmm. And what we define as sexy is extremely narrow. And in my opinion, what we define as, sex as sexy should never, ever be anywhere near an eight-year-old, mm -hmm. ever under any circumstances, period. But, you know, do I control the media? No, it would be much better if, if I did. Um, <laughs> I thought I saw another hand. Yes. I just, um, while well, honoring this course of conversation that is really deep and rich and meaningful, I just want to share something a bit personal. Please. Um, I am not sure when the Women in Large first came out, but I bought one probably shortly after that. I lived in Georgia at the time, and I think I went to a talk perhaps <coughs> in San Francisco, mm -hmm. and I bought one for my little sister who has always been large, and it just was very transformative for her. Um, she um, was in Portland at the time, and she turned around and bought, I don't know, three or five or something for a number of her friends, and everyone just loved it. So I just wanted to share that, mm -hmm. that it really changed, like, how they viewed themselves and their wholeness of the world. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. That's yeah. exactly exactly what the work is for, and that is it is it's just always wonderful. It's always really wonderful to hear. Exactly. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. If we could have a new slide, uh, we wanted to talk some about the lies that uh, that prop up the narrow body image rules. And the first and the, I think the biggest one is health. Um, the connection between fat and health is vastly exaggerated. I cannot begin to tell you how inaccurate it is. Um, in, in many cases, it's outright untrue. There's a giant study of women's health called the nurses study. Um, it's like I forget, 200,000 women over 20 years. 
and they studied a thousand things. They didn't just study weight, and it's used for all kinds of purposes. But what they ended up finding out was that the category that medicine calls moderately obese is the longest lived category. Women who are, quote, moderately obese live longer than women who are, quote, normal sized. And when this does get reported in the news, it's always skewed. It's like, it kind of seems like these women live longer, but we don't really believe it because it can't be true because we know fat is bad for you. So you should diet even though this is a medi even though the medical opinion is that if you're moderately obese, you live longer than anybody else. Right, <laughs> right. Um, there's a fairly recent book called The Big Fat Surprise by a woman named Nina Teicholz that basically takes apart the way the science that dietary fat is bad for you was invented. She just, you know, excises it. It's brilliant. Um, there are places, there are places where fat makes you healthier that nobody ever talks to you talks about. Fat women are more protected from osteoporosis uh, because I'm, I'm, my bones are working all the time. Carrying my weight, my bones are stronger. Uh, this, I almost brought this up, Elaine, today with you. Fat, if you have to go through chemotherapy, starting out fat is very good for you for reasons that I think I don't even have to explain. Um, but to me, the most important point is that all the diseases that are linked to fat, I'm not talking about if your knees hurt, that's probably because your knees are carrying a lot of weight. That's different. But it's stroke and heart disease. Those are diseases of oppression. They're not diseases of fat. They're common in the black community of people of all sizes. Lori just found this week an article in the New York Times Magazine um, that said, and this is a quote, weight-based discrimination increases cortisol production, as all stress does. High cortisol levels drive eating. So basically, be, being oppressed for your weight makes you fatter. They did uh, a study where they had uh, people, I, I don't know, I don't remember. It was 110 uh, college undergraduates, okay. women, all women. All women. And one of them watched a neutral film, one group, the control group, and the other group watched a film about, you know, a really unpleasant film about the evils of fat. And then they just put out food for everybody. And the people who watched the really oppressive film about fat ate three times as much. Because when you're stressed, it's a natural reaction to that particular hormone to eat. Right. You know, it's part of the way we're, we're, we're wired because certainly there was a time when that was a very good idea. I, I get sidetracked and I forget because we have two more slides in this section about health. But so questions, comments, reactions, responses? Yes, yes. here and the, you and then in the back. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say yeah, um, your fat cells will hold on to toxins. And so, yeah, it, it pays to have a little extra weight in this toxic world. Yes. And so it's a lot easier um, to... Um, it, you feel it's protective. It's protective, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. I knew about fat cells and toxins, but I never thought about it as protective. I like that. In the back with the beret. Yeah, uh, you're talking about fat and knees. There's really no connect necessary no. connection with that. Interesting. So I, I, a lot of fat people have problems with their knees, a lot of... I should have said is there is no disease that only fat people get and one good thing always to ask your doctor when they prescribe losing weight is what would you tell a thin person who came in with the same problem mm -hmm. um, yeah. one of the women actually um, who's not, not Susan, one. but one of the women who was in women at large basically complained well she could go to the doctor with bronchitis 
She could go to the doctor with a broken finger. It didn't matter what she went to the doctor for. The first thing <coughs> he was going to tell her, or she was going to tell her, was to lose weight. And as I think we may or may not have mentioned <coughs> earlier, the vast majority of the studies around fat and health are paid for by the diet companies. Mm -hmm. And we don't need to have to talk mm -hmm. about just the way the GMO this. studies are paid, paid for yeah. by Monsanto. Yeah, and the way as soon as um, the, the stomach stapling operations became approved, the clinics just blossomed. The, the amount of money sure. that is being made on that now is just terrifying. Yes, and, and, the, and the things that are turning out to be wrong with it uh, are yeah, things that are happening to people. Us. So let's have one more slide before we change topics. This is actually, this is not only a, a very favorite slide of mine, this came from that community conversation about what do you want to see. And so many people said we want to see fat women being active. Um, Emerald. Can you say something about the use of the word obese? Okay, yes, I can. Um, obese, to me, obese is kind of a neutral word. Um, I like the word fat, I hate the word overweight. Because over, if somebody calls me overweight, they're assuming they know something about what my right weight is that I don't think they know. Um, obese is a medical word, and it's based in large part on BMI, body mass index. And I said this on Elaine's show this morning, too. Body mass index was invented by a French statistician with no medical training. And it's a very simple fraction. It's basically, it's, it's your height over a fraction of your, I don't remember exactly how it works. It's meaningless. <laughs> a, a person who's carrying a lot, a lot of body fat and a football player can have the exact same BMI. Uh, there used to be, I think you can probably still find it in the web archives, a woman named Kate Harding did a, blog for a long time called Shapely Prose. <coughs> and she did a slideshow of people with, I guess the BMI slideshow of people, and it's just, the variation was just amazing, because it has a great deal to do with height. Um, I don't mind obese. I mind the moderately obese and morbidly obese. Mm -hmm. Morbidly obese is obviously not anything anybody wants to hear. Um, and it is, a, it is a formal medical term, in case people don't know that. Um, yeah, I, for me, and maybe that's personal, the word obese has the same kind of medicalization, and I, I don't much care for it. I mean, the word fat is clearly a reclaimed word. It doesn't feel like a reclaimed word to me, because we've been doing it now. For, we reclaimed it 30 we years ago, along with a lot of other ago. people. But um, it, fat, to me, is like thin. It's, it's a descriptive word. And um, in the 19th, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. In the 19th century, it probably meant you looked like Lillian Russell at 220 and were stunningly beautiful. Another question. Uh, a comment that I consider the word obese to be the the B word or the M word for mm -hmm. fat people. Yeah, well, Interesting. I, I, that no, it I, is I pejorative, and uh, I'm offended by the word. Uh, I don't know if people look at me and think of me as obese, but medically, that is the category that my body is in, and I'm definitely on the low end of fat, and I have many people close in my life that are much fatter than I am, and they're highly offended by that word. Well, okay. I don't use it. When I say it's neutral, I mean to my ears. It's not a word I use. And I thought that was what I just said. That is. <laughs> be clear. I thought that's what I just said. Yeah, and I think um, when you're dealing with stigmatized words, stigmatized people, I think there are whole areas that are always going to be are going to need to be talked about because if they didn't need to be talked about it, this wouldn't be an issue. Yeah, no, I think that's a very good. good question over here. Well, I, I think you touched on this. Uh, there's an inherent gender bias with the BMI and the fact that um, well, men are given more slack because what men put on is muscle and mm -hmm. what women tend to put on more easily is fat as opposed to muscle. 
So when women, um, if you take two people, a, a man and a woman of the same height, and you put them next to each other, they may weigh the same amount, possibly, or really close, but there's an, a bias towards the, in the charge that's built into the charge that makes a more, gives more of an allowance for men than for women. Absolutely. Simply because they are uh, more, uh, more muscly. Do or know, perceived as more muscly. Yeah, right. I was going to say something else. Do you know anything in the culture that doesn't do that? No, 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 not really. <laughs> <laughs> in Japan, it's, I, I did know the details, I don't remember. In Japan, it's a waist measurement thing. If your waist is over a certain size, it's their equivalent of BMI. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I actually, uh, last time I looked, because I don't have much of a waist, I actually failed that test. <laughs> but then I am the before pictures in the Japanese diet ads. Right. And that's, that, that, that conversation will come later. Right. So move, moving on to a new slide and to talk about beauty. Do you, I, I talked about health, you want to talk about beauty? Sure. Basically, almost none of the ways that we, look, we are trained to look at beauty are real. Um, one of the things that happened in this century, as I think uh, we started to, I started to say earlier, was the perception of what was beautiful changed. And that, there I was talking about size. If you look at movies from the 1920s, the chorus girls would put on very severe diets. And it starts in the earlier part of the century for what turns out to be a very interesting, which should be an obvious reason. As women start to take on power, and as feminism, first wave, second wave feminism happen, women are required to become smaller and smaller. In the 19th century, where women are perceived as middle class women, are perceived as the angel in the house, and there's a whole deification of women which does not involve either brains or education. Women were quite large. Women in the 200 plus sizes were considered the epitome of beauty. If you look at a lot of Victorian paintings. You're going to see very good sized women. Lillian Russell, as I mentioned earlier, who was a great beauty at the time, who was you know, roughly 220 pounds. So you're getting, that's happening about size, as women get smaller and smaller, and as we have noticed, continue to be, down to the photoshopping, where you see women whose waists are uh, the same size as their thighs. So that, that's a piece of it. But we also have all of the <coughs> other ways um, that women are perceived. I'm going to quote this. Renoir paintings would not be beautiful, stunning photographs uh, if you didn't have, if fat, if fat was acceptable now. If people really look at those, fo those women, they are, not, they are no longer considered beautiful. And we don't have, our image of beauty of people of color is so limited that it's kind of scary. If you, get out, if you get outside of the entertainment industry, there is just horrifying the middle. And that, that's true of men as well. We want our beautiful people to be thin, white, blonde, blue-eyed, and very young. And everybody is made to measure themselves against this by all of the pressures that come in. And it's, um, if you really look at just how bad it is, it's really quite awful. And it has very little to do with, with real beauty, which of course is what my work is about. It's about, you know, the beauty of what people really look like. And that, you know, and that's really what what we, what we do. So I, this would be... It's, part of it is about getting past what you've been told all your life is that only this one thing is beautiful and learning, learning to see it bigger. One of the things that when we started doing this work, uh, we found out that people get nervous. If you take a picture like this one, which is uh, just about to be a major uh, publicity picture for a major uh, exhibit in Japan, uh, people would look at it and they would say, well, if that's beautiful, then do I have to stop thinking of what I've always thought of as beautiful? And, you know, it's, it's a, there's a kind of glasses half empty, glasses half full, of uh, only one thing can be beautiful concept that is exactly 
what we are working against. Yeah. Something we used to say, which is not bad to quote, is it should be, beauty should be a fountain. It should not be this small cup that if somebody gets it, somebody else has to, somebody else has to lose it. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, one of the things we found in the work, and let's have another slide, is that it's not just with women in large, it wasn't just fat women. With familiar men, it wasn't just men. People who love or are family members with or are close to people that aren't thought of as beautiful get enormous permission from seeing these pictures. It's like, oh my goodness, it's okay. Oh my goodness, I can now, like, I've always thought my wife was beautiful, but now there's a place where I can say it. Um, it's really interesting how constrained everybody is around this, even if they fit into the, the conventional story themselves. Yeah, and we also, of course, found out how many people who very comfortably fit into the conventional story about beauty are profoundly uncomfortable. About and don't think they do. And don't think they do. Or um, I, when I taught dance, the women I had in my classes, and they were pretty, pretty varied in size and age and so on, the women I had who were the most uncomfortable, the woman I had actually in my class who was the most uncomfortable about her body was a professional model. Mm -hmm. And she just would look in the mirror and just shred herself. Well, and if you're a professional model, you hear nothing all day but what's wrong with you. It's way worse than what you hear in an office or what you hear in a store or what you hear on a farm. You know, but for the minute you walk in, it's like, oh, look at that. That's not right. That's not right. That's not right. That's not right. So, um, more questions, questions comments? Yes. I had a comment, you know. I've been thinking about this all day long, and uh, <clears throat> another memory came up for me, and I realized why, how women live in torment. When I was at home, my Aunt Sarah used to like the Ziegfeld Follies, and they had a magazine, and in the magazine, they actually had all the numbers. It was 36, 26, 36, and my aunt used to come and measure us. And <clears throat> I was telling them when I interviewed them on the show that my mother used to put cinch belts underneath my clothes because I never had a small waist. I was straight down. And I was thinking about that. And I'm looking, and, and at the same time, I'm looking at all these pictures. And, I'm, and I said, I feel like this is what I've been fighting all my life. Not, you, you understand what I'm saying? Yes, I, I do. And, and when, I, when I heard you say about the, you know, the, the, the women, the, the actresses, you know, the one. Mm -hmm. That would be me, always subconscious, always unsure because I don't look good, or even my husband says, "Oh, you're beautiful," and I live. Well, what's he talking about? You know, I mean, it just lives with you. Like it's almost like in your pores. Yeah. 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 One of the other things that got me into this work was the fact that I have two daughters, and they're ten years apart. And my older daughter grew up at a time that was not nearly as pressured. Mm -hmm. And then my younger daughter started hitting like the third grade, and she wasn't fat but she was getting harassed about her size. Mm -hmm. And it was one, oh, she, it worked out fine. There, there, was, a, there's a, there was a group called Fat Lip Readers Theater in San Francisco, mm -hmm. which was a marvelous <coughs> Fat Lip performance group. And my daughter would go to everyone and bring her little autograph book around. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact that I was doing this work made a huge difference in her life. She was, she was like their, their original, she was like eight years old, and she was like their, their, their original, one of the profound members of their fan club. Mm -hmm. okay, are there any other questions or comments? Okay, we were gonna maybe go on to the next slide. We were gonna talk a little bit about <coughs> history and geography, what, what one group thinks is beautiful, another group will not think is beautiful. Uh, what, just the whole concept of looks varies greatly over time and space. Lori and I just both read, uh, she read and talked me into reading, a fantastic book called <coughs> The History of White People by a black uh, academic named Nell Irvin Painter. And one of the things Painter says that w is that we always associate strength, virility, and ugliness with the barbarians, with the people across the hill, the people we don't trust. And our own culture is a little effete, a little intellectual, 
maybe a little weak, maybe needs to be protected. And the whole story of why white people are called Caucasians comes exactly from that, uh, that process. The Georgian women were considered to be the most beautiful women. And I mean Georgia in, in Europe, not the Georgia. Ca the, Caucasus. the Caucasus. The women of the Caucasus were the most beautiful women. And that's how we all got to be called the, Caucasians. The women of the Caucasus were the most beautiful women. They were also the most desirable slaves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So what you have is Caucasian slaves are the most beautiful women. Right. And from there comes the word Caucasian for uh, what we now call white people. Right. That's a slide. Highly recommend the book. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, in, in our own time, Laurie was talking about Lillian Russell, but closer, a little closer in time is Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn Monroe would, would now be a size probably 14, which is a size that we're already in this, in this time considering to be a little too big, or a bit possibly a lot too big. If you're if you think about Hollywood, it's a huge amount too big. She was the most, the most beautiful woman in the world. Uh, she couldn't walk down the street, she was so beautiful. And now she would be, you know, kind They would of, tell her that she should probably lose weight. If yes. She wanted to be in the movies. Exactly. <laughs> So um, I have another slide. And we've gotten ahead of ourselves. We have, we're, we're behind on slides for what we want to talk about. Okay. And I'm going to guess you want me to talk about art, even though I've just been talking. I think I want you to talk about art, and then I will probably talk about art. OK, fine. So we'll go on again. One more slide. I think I will say this because we have it's really important to see people who look like us and look like the people we love. And one of the major points of the diversity of the work we did was so that people could see people who looked like them. And one more. Right. And to, to make just to make it as wide a range as possible of where you can see images that look that look like you whatever you look like, you know, because if all you do is go to the movies, you're only going to see five people, basically. Five looks, five ways of looking, or four or six. And yet, there are so, 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 so many ways for people to look, particularly in this country where we're such a diverse, people come from all over, they intermarry, there are mixes of this and that. I mean, how often do you talk to somebody and you're kind of thinking, I wonder what their ethnicity is, I can't make it out. Uh, but it's often lovely. Um, so yeah. So I think that's Lori's special skill, is to bring out the beauty in everybody. There's a question here. Yes. Oh, I'm Two. sorry. Um, yes. Questions. Yes, and then yes. Um, when you were mentioning the movies, there was something that kind of triggered in me. Yeah. And I don't see a lot of conventional entertainment. I don't own a TV. But one of the things that I've noticed is that usually when there is a star, there's a sidekick. And often the sidekick is overweight. Or at times the sidekick is overweight. And when the sidekick is overweight, the sidekick is both, and I am making a generalization here, I'm sure people can talk about movies where it's different, they are both stupid and they're likely to get killed. And my husband of 30 years is very tall and slender, and we would go to a movie and I'd say, you know, I'd see the person, I'd go, that person's gonna get killed before the end of the movie. And he'd go, how do you know? <laughs> and so I'd like to challenge people to watch this and, and be aware of it. And I'm not saying it's in every movie, but, there's this connection like that. This person is the secondary person. This kid person is the, you well, know. They're not just secondary. Yeah. What you're saying yeah. is they're disposable. So they're, they're, they're disposable. <laughs> and then the other formula that, you know, since nowadays Hollywood is supposed to give employment to minorities is you'll have the white star being the lead. You'll have the black star being the second lead, you know, the sidekick. And guess who's going to wind up there? Right. So I just had to throw that right. Way. And if there happens to be a queer character, yeah, you can rely on them them winding up dead. Yeah. So, you know that? Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Um, I was wondering if you could backtrack a little bit to sizes, because clo clothes sizing. Oh, sure. sure. Because, um, Happily, there is a 
disconnect that seems to happen with sizing, the sizing of clothing. And I'm often very confused by it because I have in my mind um, pretty much like a standard, uh, and I think we all do, that you know, uh, small means small and medium means something in between small and large. And then there are other sizes beyond that that are, get progressively a little larger and a little larger. And when I'm um, looking for clothing, what often happens is that I have this idea that, OK, I'm somewhere between a medium and a large or something. But then the clothing seems to say that it's larger, but it seems to be getting smaller and smaller as the labeling gets larger and larger. <laughs> so is this really happening? Or is this an illusion? Or is this a have you noticed this? Is this actually happening? I do have something to say because it's not yeah, yeah I, I, of course I have something to say. I buy clothes. Um, they don't let me go around naked except in Lori's pictures. Um, I think that it's actually more complicated than that. I think everybody has their own set of numbers and there's no consistency, right? And often if I, I buy from a catalog, I buy from one catalog where I know their clothes fit me and I like their colors and, and their fabrics, but they have charts that say, we call it this number, but somebody else calls it this number, and somebody else calls it this number, and somebody else calls it this number. And by then, my eyes are glazed over, and I'm like, <laughs> I'm just going back to the number that I know. Um, I think that it is almost intentionally made as hard as possible so that you don't know and you, and you will always be anxious and you will always worry about whether or not what you're, whether or not you should be smaller and you will believe that if you were smaller it would make more sense, right? There's kind of an implicit. And I can say something, when you're smaller it doesn't make more sense. Right, but you believe that it would. Well, I don't believe it. I don't believe personally, <laughs> but yes, but you believe that it would because it's, you know, you are smaller, you are the size, and I'm saying this in quotes, you are supposed to be, so all of this should work for you. And in contrast to what we've been saying about how much worse this has gotten in the last decade, I uh, spent time when I was growing up in my grandmother's clothing store in, in the field they used to call ladies ready to wear. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother was very popular because she put smaller size tags mm -hmm. on the larger size dresses. Mm -hmm. And the woman would say, in Mrs. Shulman's store, I can wear a 12. <laughs> <laughs> So this has been going on a very long time. The other thing I would say is this is one of the things that, regardless of the sizing issues, has gotten a lot better since we started this work. When we started this work, what was available to fat women were basically stretch pants and shirts that looked like smocks. In polyester. In polyester. And that was pretty much it. And there were a very few small companies starting to make attractive clothes for fat women. And one of the things that has changed over this year is over these years. Over these years is that um, there's a lot more available now than mm -hmm. there was. It, it's it's really a, what this is something where there actually is, regardless of the issues, there have been remarkable improvements. Yes. Men's clothing is very consistent in size. Yes. Yes. <laughs> men are because if men are confused, they walk out. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> I take a picture of that. <laughs> I actually was meaning it as a compliment in this particular context. You had something to say? Well, I just wanted to say uh, maternity clothes also have kind of, you know. I think that's one of life's great understatements. In maternity clothes, at one point, you basically looked like you were wearing the nursery curtains. Yes. <laughs> yes. Hands. And now you're basically seeing, you know, everything. A very attractive skin tight clothes. Yeah. Yes. Like, yes. There's been a, a phenomenal change. That, that that I love. Yeah. Yeah. That I love because when I was pregnant, I was married to somebody who did not like my body, and as it changed and grew, he freaked out. So um, I just love seeing those big bellies. Yeah. And then when there's somebody, <laughs> why hide that? <laughs> Let's go on to the next slide. I think one of the other things that's true about the work is for a lot of people, we would do the slideshow, people would look at the book, and 
they'd see us again maybe a month later or two months later, or maybe someone gave them the book, and they would say, you know, when I first looked at these pictures, I thought they were awful and they made me really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But you know, now I think these women look beautiful and I look beautiful. So it's also a process because it, it, you know we're, we're all so conditioned. You're, you're fighting. You're, you know, I'll go back to Elaine. You're fighting what's in your pores, um, and it, it's not easy. And if these if the images bother you or unsettle you, there are reasons for that. It's not because you're not. It's not because there's something wrong with you. Yes, I mean we haven't. We've been talking here mostly about size. We haven't even really touched on issues around age and aging and the fact that as soon as anybody gets a line in their face, they can't ever look good again unless you know they have it medically taken care of. And we haven't. I just read the most marvelous article. I haven't showed it to you yet, by a woman in Southern California who had Botox treatments on her eyebrows and her, and she's miserable. And she said, I can't scowl. Yeah. I have the world's best scowl. And now I can't scowl. <laughs> and you know, but yeah, she didn't really realize what she was getting into. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I also Do people know about Botox? Botox is botuli botulinum toxin. It's food poisoning. And you voluntarily have it injected into your skin. So your skin won't wrinkle? Yeah, it, yeah. that's one of its uses. Well, there are some very fine medical yeah. uses for Botox. Right. There are. A friend of but ours actually has just used it for some stuff. A friend of ours actually has just used Botox for medical reasons. Right. It's mm -hmm. been somewhat effective. Yes, yeah. but, but, but yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. But making Cosmetic this, Botox. Cosmetically, yeah. is not, not a good yeah. idea. So let's go on and talk some about men. So I think we need the next slide. We do need the next slide. Do you want to go? Yeah, doing familiar men was very, in well, I think, well, I don't do anything I don't think is very interesting, but doing familiar men was really interesting. Other people do her laundry. <laughs> That's true. It is true. But, um, because what I thought, I didn't realize, I mean, I became a photographer when I was 47 to do Women on Mars. And that was my f that was the first work I did, and I thought I was going to go on and do more nudes of women. And I realized that for me, women at large was really my statement on the female nude, and I wanted to do a book of male nudes, and it was very. Thank you. Thank you. It was very different and some very interesting. Was, first of all, it was about masculinity, which is something <coughs> we thought we knew a lot about and spent these projects usually take about five years. And five years later, we realized at that point we knew a reasonable amount. But masculinity is like air. It's, you know, you don't, we don't think about it in this culture. This is less true now than it was when I did the book, but it's, it's still more true than not. And we never see male nudes. The, a full frontal nudity in men is completely taboo unless it's in some kind of erotica, and more often uh, queer erotica. And it turned out that compared Women on large was mainstream compared to the, the reaction to familiar men. Mm -hmm. um, familiar men sold and it got out in the world. It did not sell as well as women on large. There's a less clear audience for it. There's for a partly thing. there's a less clear audience, but also showing a non-erect penis in this culture is something you just don't do. Hmm. And think about where think about when you've seen work like that. There was photography, particularly. Paintings are different, because paintings allow people a certain kind of distance, and it's not as real. And it was, and I was very, very happy with it. We also got to do an even better diversity because we had the experience. I knew that there were some people where, if I wanted photographs of particular groups of people, we had to start immediately, like five, we, you know, immediately, because then four years later I would have made the connections to get the pictures. And there is a greater diversity in the work that made me really happy. That actually, as we are looking at it, I think is one of the most beautiful pictures I've ever done. And it, it's in a couple of museum collections. It's in a, that one, that's in, in a, a couple, couple, couple of museum, museum collections. But that, I think, is one of the most beautiful pictures I've done. 
that's going to the next one, which is, which is one of the most popular pictures I've ever yeah. done, and also beautiful. This is a grandfather and a grandson. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very popular in Japan, and it's, it's, here it's kind of discomforting, and people will sometimes say, are they lovers? Um, but in Japan, there's a tradition, of course, of being naked in, in the baths with the people of, with your family members of your own gender. The Japanese have a tradition of kind of private nudity and public privacy. But they're actually, well, for example, um, I had a solo show at the National Museum of Art in Osaka, and part of it was they always bring school kids to it. So, uh, you know, like 30 kids, probably between 6 and 10, came to see the work and hear the artist talk about it. In this country, that would be illegal. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, it, it's and, and it, shocking, and shocking, and it simply wasn't shocking in those ways. There, mm -hmm. um, comfort in the normal human body. The kind of pictures I do is shocking there in a different way, but it's not about the nudity per se. It's about the acceptance of a range of beauty. One of the things that, that was fascinating to me work, working on Familiar Men, Lori was taking the pictures, but I, we were talking about it all the time and I was talking to models and collecting writing for the book. It, uh, what makes a nude? If you take a picture of a woman's back, like from her shoulder to her waist, uh, with no clothes on, it's a nude. If you take a picture of a man that doesn't show his penis, it's not a nude. It's just kind of a man with, without a lot of clothes on. Uh, it's really, really different. Um, Lori has a story, but this is the woman in the doorway. Yeah. Uh, I was walking through some dark streets in San Francisco, and a doorway opened upstairs, you know, and there was a woman in the doorway, and she was nude, and the light kind of glowed around her. And it was really just this very lovely moment, and, you know, I was far away from her, and not intruding in any way, and I just went, wow, that's really lovely, and moved on. If I had seen a naked man in the doorway, I would have had a very different reaction. Mm -hmm. And that tells you right there just an awful lot about the way the culture feels mm -hmm. about men and women's bodies. Mm -hmm. So to move on to the next slide, which we were... Well, oh, actually, I want oh, to tell you go back. about... Go back. How do I go back? That's a good question. <laughs> Sorry. I only go forward. <laughs> Left arrow. There. Yes. Uh, okay, this, was a <laughs> this was a poster for an exhibition that I had at in Japan. In Japan I was there for that one. At a, a university in, in Kyoto. And they very discreetly partly covered the penises with Japanese writing, but not completely. And this was in some In the subway. This is in the subway and on the train stations. Right. So okay. it is a very. On the other thing, there are things when I did the Japanese project that they found very shocking. Because it, in, in clothed pictures. Yeah. Um, now, if we could go on to the next slide. This was actually, I think, you'd have to call this luck. Um, oh, completely. The, completely. the photo on the left <laughs> is a photo from Women at Large. The photo uh -huh. on the right is a photo from Familiar Men. It's the same person oh, for what? who sense. happened to transition oh. between oh, wow. the two books. Oh, and when I asked him if he wanted to be in the book, he went, I would be delighted. He was really, really happy about it. And the similarity of the poses is a complete accident. <laughs> I, that is completely unplanned. I took a picture of her sitting in front of the fireplace, and when I took the picture of him in the backyard, uh, it's just you know, pure serendipity of body well, language. Well, serendipity and, and, and the fact that they had similar body languages despite right. the changes. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and they <laughs> ended up falling into the same poses. I just, I don't think we've talked mm -hmm. about the fact that I don't, one thing we haven't talked about is, which I certainly should have, is when I photograph people, we always go out and talk about it for like an hour and about the work. Then I let people think about it. I'll come back maybe a month later and take their picture if they've decided on it. And all the pictures are people in their own homes or settings they chose. In, Lori doesn't position you. She I, might say, move away from that light switch. It looks like it's growing out of your ear. Exactly. Um, <laughs> but she won't say, put your hand here. Yeah, um, it's just the opposite. I'm working with people to get a natural sense of their body language. And these shoes can be anywhere between two to five hours, out of which I'm going to end up with one or two photographs. We have one more. 
um, when he has a hand, we have one more <laughs> transgender picture. Um, when, we, when we were writing the notes for this particular uh, presentation, we were trying to think about what has changed. And the ways people think about gender and the fluidity of gender is a huge change. And if we did these books now, we would be giving a lot more thought to how to present that in these books. So we thought having some trans pictures would sort of help give some context for that. Yeah, because the world, the world and the perceptions of gender has changed profoundly. And the vocabulary. Gender. And the vocabulary. And, not, and the vocabulary and the enormous amount of thought that didn't start in the 80s, but certainly has developed. Right, and, the, and there's the, just the sheer numbers of people who are transitioning, thinking about transitioning, talking about it, know someone who has transitioned. It's just, it's really, in my life, it's incredibly different. Yeah. yeah. My sister-in-law called me up a couple of years ago and said, do you know anybody who uses the pronoun they? Uh -huh. And I said, honey, sometimes I think I don't know anybody who doesn't use the pronoun they, which isn't true, but was, was kind of an honest feeling. Mm -hmm. So we're not gonna go on and talk about Japan, but this is a really good place for more questions. Yeah. Which way is that person going? <laughs> so that probably answers your question. So she's, she's a girl. She's a she girl. Is she is. She's becoming. She, she is. A no, she she is, is a girl. She's becoming a man. No, no, no. She became a girl a long time ago. Yes. She was a man. She became a girl a pretty long time ago. She mm -hmm. must have become a woman. Right? Yes. A woman, yes. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. All right. Let's go on. Yes, oh, Peter. Well, what do you yeah, say? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. When you say things have changed, have they gotten better or they've gotten worse? Or are people more accepting? I, mean, I think the change? world is absolutely more accepting. Look at the way the laws are changing. It's still, it, it's, it, it can still be it's incredibly terrible. awful, yes. but, it, but, it's, but it's better than it was. There's a difference between incredibly awful and completely illegal, unaccepted, and unacceptable, mm -hmm. and the world can do anything they want to you, and very, very difficult but you have, at least in some parts of this country, a legal position and some rights. Right. Well, I'm thinking about this, this young, this uh, Jenner. Caitlyn Jenner. Caitlyn Jenner, and you know, when, when she came out, I mean, she's just so gorgeous and so perfect and so covert, and I had someone at work, a, 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 a male, you know, one of my employees that was working with me, that, that trying, you know, that, what do you say? Transition? Transition. And he was not beautiful like that. I mean, he wasn't. He was not a beauty. He was not a beautiful woman. I mean, well, Caitlyn was, was Jenner got bad. all the beauty that money can buy. Yeah, yeah. really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How does that affect? It's mixed. Sure. I, I, I think. You want me to answer that? I think you have to say something about class. Yeah, you well, can answer it, but you have to say something about class. I was class. going to say something about <laughs> class, but before I say something about class, which I think in part I said by the best body, you know, the best beauty money can buy, is that. Um, I think it's mixed. I think any time a major celebrity comes out in, in that kind of a way, I think it does good because it makes it more acceptable for everybody else. Absolutely. I think the fact that Caitlyn Jenner came out into a kind of beauty which is an absolute class, class and money issue is something that is unfortunate, but I think on balance I would much rather have had it happen than not. Because every public figure who makes whatever it is, in this case transitioning to gender, more acceptable still makes it better for everybody, even if the fact that she, you know, got this extraordinary, not only beauty, but she's in her middle 60s, and Lord knows that's not how she looks. <laughs> uh, I think the upside is much, much bigger than the downside. And the upside, truthfully, is no worse than everything else that's going on in the media. I think, I think one example that I think about a lot is Christopher Reeve, mm -hmm. uh, which is not a gender example, but when Christopher Reeve had his accident, um, he had a kind of support because of his money and his fame that many, many, people many people okay. who are as disabled as he was would can't even imagine, mm -hmm. right? And at the same time, he brought some visibility and some uh, ways of thinking 
into the big world because we're so celebrity focused. If you can't name a celebrity who's done something, it kind of isn't real. Um, so I, yeah, I think I think I'm with Laurie on this. And as for your your employee, some people have better style than others. <laughs> you know, so when they're men, when they're women, when they transition, whatever, style is personal. And it, he, she may get better at it. Um, but no, if you're talking about someone who isn't traditionally beautiful, that's a whole other thing, though. I mean, yeah. we are we are all kind of how we look. And that doesn't mean you're not beautiful. It just means you don't look like Kathleen Jenner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I, mean, that's, I mean, that's the other thing. I mean, th this whole conversation is about not using that as a beauty standard. Right. Um, you know. Um, he certainly looks a lot happier. Oh, well, almost yeah. every, almost yeah. everybody who transitions. Yeah, no, I, as it happens, I was around from the point where she had just gone into transition, and then she and my daughter were together for like 13 years. I so, think we're not, we're talking about Caitlyn Jenner. Oh, I beg your pardon. Oh, I'm sure she's much happier. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, I think almost everybody is. And I will also say that it, it takes a different kind of bravery to transition if you're a public figure. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, I, there are just different aspects to it, but anyway. So, should we go on to the few women yeah. of Japan pictures? We're almost done. We promise. Um, this slide. Next slide. That is not supposed to be the next slide, but that's okay. Um, do you want, what, what do you want to say about women of Japan? Well, I think I explained how it started, and the Japanese work turned out to be very culturally diverse in a country that is presented to us as homogeneous and isn't. Mm -hmm. Japan has tremendous diversity in kind of who people are, how they are perceived by the mainstream culture. One of the things I really liked about doing the Japanese work is I was showing everybody together. So I was showing both women of samurai ancestry, women who were buraku, who are descended from what originally an untouchable class, Okinawans and people of very different backgrounds. Buraku, the untouchables, that's just black. That's the way the Japanese say black, buraku. Um, linguistically. Linguistically, that, that may be so. But linguistically, it is. So. But it, it's, it doesn't mean the same thing it does here. No, it people, doesn't, but it does, it does mean... Uh, not, it, it does, it is very othering. It does it, it, mean no, not us. Yeah, it does definitely mean not us. And so I was doing people who are both considered traditionally Japanese and people who are not. Mm -hmm. And the reality is in Japan there are lots of people who are working on changing this. Um, one of the, and, and sometimes very successfully, but I was working with a very group of feminists from pretty broad backgrounds. And mm -hmm. I learned a tremendous amount from them, and it was work. If you're interested, if you go to the web, my website, which we should mention at some point, which is lauritobiedison.com, there's a whole piece of the website which is in Japanese and in English with a lot of writings by the women, mm -hmm. which would give you a, a, a very good sense of this work. This woman is Korean. And and this, go ahead. Well, and in the Japanese, uh, there's a lot of prejudice against Koreans in Japan, and even if you, if your family has lived in Japan for three generations and you're what's called a Korean three, um, there it's still a lesser status. Yeah. And I made very sure in this work, as I said, to incorporate everybody. So this is not work about marginalized women. This is work about everybody, and everybody gets shown together. And the response in Japan. From, has really been, it was extremely, extremely positive. And again, this took about seven years because I don't, obviously, I don't live there. And it was, it was very gratifying work and the feminists there are really quite remarkable mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they're, mm -hmm. they're not working in this, you know, super old school masculinist culture, which is what we were told here. Mm -hmm. But they are certainly living in a culture where it is much more difficult to be a woman. And, mm -hmm do everything you want, and it, it's true here. Although most of these women I worked with were museum curators and college professors and buraku leather workers and lots of things in between. Yeah, that's actually, yeah, that's a, that's a mother, that daughter, picture. and grandfather. Granddaughter. Granddaughter, thank you. Granddaughter. And, um, and the daughter is indeed a college professor, and they are buraku. 
but her grandmother had very few opportunities and her mother had some better. Mm -hmm. But she's really the first generation that was able to do that. Mm -hmm. Yes, are there um, physical differences with the, I won't pronounce it right, the no. black? Okay. No, and there are also, no, this, one of the women I work with, it's made it very interesting, I'm Jewish, mm -hmm. and I don't look at it. And the reality is that most of the stuff that goes on in Japan is about people who don't look any different. Mm -hmm. And so it's a different kind of discrimination than we have here. Because you know, the Amer American original sin is racism. Mm -hmm. And in Japan, it's mostly about people who, not completely, there are Ainu in Hokkaido who are the, uh, descended from the original Aboriginal people, and there are people in Okinawa who will not look quite the same. But it's much of this is people who actually look just like you. But who also do not have that everybody looks the same that they told us to expect. They have enormous individual variation. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 It, but, but there isn't like people who, they, it's not that they don't look Japanese. There is just a real breath of how people look there. Right. So, so how, how does, if, if they're discriminated against, how, do they, how are they identified? I mean, if they don't, uh, I mean, you Names, um, there's a lot of family history stuff that is recorded and goes with you. Um, some Koreans have been known to change their names so that they sound Japanese and disappear, which you can do, although it's not something anyone I know would do. Um, they have a much more kind of linear historicism about your family that follows you. Also, I think there are there are linguistic variations. You can you can hear things in people's speech. Um, not the Koreans, the Baraka. No, no, that depends, Deb. Not certainly not, absolutely not necessarily. That's okay, not fine. that's not true. Okay, she knows more than I do. That's not true <laughs> about this. Uh, people, uh, there are the records are there, and people look at them. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, there, this is a, remember. Now we Google. Your papers. Yeah, but you know, this is also true of places like Denmark. I mean, one of the things that's true is we, we're a settler culture. And so there aren't records of my family going back 400 years, if you know. And we don't do that. We do that now. We didn't used to do that. I mean, we now have, you know, the, the NSA is doing this very nicely, thank you. But um, <laughs> we're in places where people's families have lived for a very long time. Uh, I met a woman in Denmark whose family had been living in the same house for 800 years. Wow. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's just, it's a very different way of keeping track. Mm -hmm. That's think, what we have. I think that's, we'd I think. We'd love to hear more from love you. love to hear more from you, but I think that's our presentation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can I just ask a question of, of the group? I'm, I'm sorry that some people have left. Are people here aware of a national organization called NAFA? Yes, well, we are. We certainly are. But oh, please please, not, please well, tell them about it. No, uh, it's the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance. Uh, <coughs> they are having a renewed membership drive right now. They've been around for oh, more than 20 years, maybe 30 years, you might be able to tell. But they work on discrimination uh, against fat people. Uh, things like uh, bullying of children. Um, I just read their latest newsletter uh, dealing with issues, well, good news, uh, a plus size actually, what would be called super size woman, just won um, uh, the top prize on that um, TV reality show where you design clothing and so forth. And so. Project Runway. Yeah, Project Runway. So. Um, I was just hoping that there might be some people who'd be interested in creating a local chapter of that, as they do have a structure for that, and I would be willing to collect names tonight if there is anybody who's interested, and then just redistribute them along with um, some links to more information about NAPA and what they do. They distribute anti-discrimination materials to corporations, to schools, they've developed a lot of materials, and they have an annual conference on the East Coast one year, the West Coast the next year. Thank you. Thank That's you. Great. Uh, two other things I should I should Thank say. You. One is we have books yeah. here, and if anybody wants to get one, I'll be we will both be delighted to sign them for them. And I'm going to repeat the website Sorry. again because Debbie and I also do a blog called Body and Politic, where we write about body image in the broader sense. 
So if you go... Lots of posts on race, lots of posts on aging, lots of posts on gender, lots of posts on fat. Can you talk a little bit about that, about the body and politics? Well, we basically we've been doing a blog for, I guess, eight or nine years Ten. now, which is on my website. Ten years. Ten years? Wow. Ten years. Mm -hmm. Called Body and Politics. And we deal with body image in the broader sense, and I also write a fair amount about photography. Um, my work and other people's work as well. And you know, when you talk about body and politics, I notice I'm watching Hillary Clinton now in different, different aspects, and the last time she came out, the way she was dressed, it was, it was, she was just so perfect. And her face, she looked like she was 25 years younger. <laughs> It, it was it was really interesting, and I was thinking to myself, but the image she's trying to project, rather than just come out as her age, mm -hmm. it feels like she's trying to project something else. Well, given the nature of American politics mm -hmm. and how much people are saying she's too old to be president, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I don't think she's doing it, if she is doing that, I don't think she's doing it for any other reason. Because uh, mm -hmm. she certainly wasn't doing it when she was secretary. I mean, she hasn't been doing that as part of her career. And, She's surrounded by advisors, and they're all telling her different things. Right. But it's you know that's if you're a woman in politics, you have that whole extra layer to deal mm -hmm. with. Carly Fiorina, after the last debate, oh. said, "How come they criticize my looks and they never criticize Hillary's looks?" And it's like, <laughs> shut up, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Women, women are always, women's looks are always on the table for discussion. Thank you all for coming. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Stand around and thank you. Thank you. And I'm just going to put the cards here. So if you want them for information, which is on this side, if you just want them for a lovely picture of Debbie, please take one. And if you would like a book, I have them back here.